Okay. Um, hello and welcome everybody. Um, welcome to breakout session number one, resilience planning, challenges, opportunities, and interconnections. Um, I'm going to be the moderator for this next hour. Um, and just as you were able to submit questions during the first half of the program today, um, you can continue to submit your questions using the questions tab at the top of your screen. Um, myself and Katie Lund will be monitoring these questions um, and you know we'll, we'll try to incorporate those into the program. Um, so today we're going to hear a short presentation from uh, Dr. Norman Garrick, um, just you know talking a little bit about the, the role of a transit oriented development and TOD um, in what we're doing. Then we'll have um, a panel discussion um, where we'll, we'll bring some other folks to the stage and we'll kind of discuss this idea of the, the interconnections um, between you know, housing, transportation, critical infrastructure, and sort of the role of those interconnections in, in what we're doing. Um, we'll close it out with a um, presentation by David Murphy again to just talk a little bit more specifically about um, you know, phase two of Resilient Connecticut and um, kind of how we're developing adaptation scenarios through the project and some next steps there. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask uh, Norman to uh, go ahead and come to the stage and turn your mic and your video on. And right. take it away, Norman. Okay. Thank you very much. It's really nice to be part of this endeavor. I, the idea of state agencies working together on this very important issue, um, bringing the forces of the different agencies um, together is the only way forward. So let me just start by sharing my screen. Is everybody seeing that presentation? Yep, looks good. Okay, so what I want to do today, the main thing I want to do today is to recast this um, term, transit-oriented development. In my mind, this has become another meme, another fad, where we think of it as development close to transit. And for me, transit-oriented de development is at the heart of resiliency, not just from an environmental point of view, but from a social and, and economic point of view. And it's really more about how we build rather than just where we build. So I'm really happy to have um, been, to become part of this circuit team working on this project. And before I start into the presentation, I just wanted to introduce my team. You see some of them here. A few weeks ago, we decided that as part of this project, we needed to actually see what was on the ground along transit and also what it was like to ride transit in Fairfield County. So we um, took the bus from stores, got the train from Hartford, to the train to New Haven, and then we went to South Norwalk and toured a, a few towns, including Bridgeport and Westport, along the um, along the corridor. And you see here some of my team members, including um, Dr. Carl Atkinson Palumbo of the Geography Department, Rosalie Ray, who is heading up this project, uh, who just joined us as a postdoc from Columbia University, and she has a political science background. And two of the undergrads that are working with us, we have a total of three undergrads working with us on this project. You see here, Sean Doolittle and Luke Lombardo. And we also have Akira Dunbar um, working with us. So that's the team. So let me get into the, um, the presentation itself. So transit-oriented development, to understand transit-oriented development in the context of Connecticut, we need to go back a few years. 
And this particular map is of Connecticut, the rail system, the New Haven, um, New York, New Haven, uh, New York, New Haven system that serve Connecticut and Southern New England. And I think there's a, a few things that are revealing about this map. One of the things that I, I struck me was the, 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 the stretch of electrified railroad from um, New York to New Haven. Um, and that is still the only stretch of electrified railroad in the state. And to me is emblematic of the, the U-turn that we took years ago to go towards a different type of transportation system and also a different type of development. So I bring this map to show just how extensive the rail system is, but also to emphasize the point that most of what, a lot of what we see in Connecticut is transit oriented development. So places like New uh, Waterbury, like Willimantic, like uh, Rockville, those places were built on the premise that they were going to be accessed by transit. So we consider ourselves as a suburban state, but the foundation, the building block of our state is transit oriented development. And I think that's a really important point to take going forward as we are considering how we can take advantage. This is an advantage that we have over other states are states in the Sun Belt that do not have this core pattern of development and that we can build on. So this is a rail system we had uh, back in 1929, but this system was also supported by uh, interurbans and trolley systems. This is the system that we have recreated for Hartford County, and you can see it stretches 40 miles to the east, all the way to Stafford Springs, um, uh, another 15 miles to the, to the west and north and south of the city, and very extensive system within the city itself. So transit-oriented development, not just the rail, but also these street running systems that supported connection to the rail. Um, by 19... By 1920, the system had reached its peak. 1930, we had started dismantling. So during the decades of the 20s, we started dismantling the system. This is what was left in 1930. 1940, almost nothing left outside of the city of Hartford. And by 1943, all gone. And the reason why I want to emphasize this slide is that it shows that we have been at the job of creating non-transit oriented development, automobile dependent development for a very, very long time. So when we are talking about transit oriented development, we are really talking about changing a, an 80 year project, 80, um, 80 years of building in a different way. And what we're trying to do is to reverse that, at least in some places. Um, and we have this sense of our state as being suburban, and that is fed by the media, by movies. In every way, we are told that we are suburban. And the irony of movies like Mr. Blandin's Dream House is that these these movies were almost all set in transit oriented development with people commuting to New York City. So these people were dependent on the train, but that was not what was shown in the movies. What was shown in the movies were these suburban style housing on two acre, three acres lots. And that's what we told ourselves that our state was about. And that's what we built all over the state. And to a large extent, we rode this idea of ourselves to great prosperity in the 60s, 70s, and then it started to slow down in the 80s and 90s. And, and so it's in some ways it's been good for us, but in other ways, if we look at more long-term implication, it has been a horrible 
way of developing for our state. And just to illustrate one of these ways that has been disastrous, this, this data is from the Buffalo metropolitan area. I haven't seen any similar data. We should have data like this for Hartford and for Bridgeport and for Stamford. But it shows what, what the pattern of development that we embraced in the 1930s and 40s, what it leads to. So this is the Buffalo metropolitan area in 1950, 120 square miles. By 2015, this had tripled in size. And you would think, OK, that's fine. They're probably hosting more people. There is a larger economy, et cetera. The reality is that in, two, in 1950, this area had 1.1 million people. In now, they have 1.2 million people, so almost no growth in population. So think about the implication of doing that. Think about spreading people all over the land. Think about the environmental implication, but also think about the cost of having to service so much land for so few people. And this is, in essence, what has happened in Connecticut, in us spreading without actually growing in population. Um, if you think about the flip side of this is what has happened to our cities, not unlike what happened in Buffalo, with a population going from five, 580,000 to just 260,000. What we see in Bridgeport, in Hartford, Hartford went from 190 to now at 120. It's not as severe but we're seeing very similar patterns. And the landscape you're looking at there is very much like what you see in Hartford, in Bridgeport, in New Haven. This is actually data that we, we, we created, maps we created showing parking in Hartford in 1957. By, nine, by 2009, we had tripled the amount of parking, parking in red, we have changed the character of downtown. We have gotten rid of the fine-grained structure. We had built a freeway, two freeways through the town. So all of this was in an effort to change the character, to move towards the car utopia that we, we, um, we desired. And, you, and any of you that know Hartford or Bridgeport, understand that this is not, this is a disaster. This is not a utopia. This is what Hartford looks like now from the air. And one of the studies that we have conducted, we found that using the land in this way, we are potentially losing $20 million each year in Hartford. So when you think about the crisis that Bridgeport went through a few years ago, think about this land use and think about the implication of this land use on this city. In this city, which you probably would never recognize from this graph showing a mixed use, functional, vibrant city, green, residential, blue, mixed use, purple, commercial, orange government building. This is downtown Bridgeport with the railroad running across the southern edge. This is Bridgeport in 1913. This is what we have created since then. An absolutely different place. Most of the white space you see there is either fallow or parking. The only tax paying businesses or um, properties here are in blue or in green. Think about the tax implication and then you start to understand why this city almost went bankrupt just two or three years ago. So this is the different direction that we went to, the implication on the city, but also 
on this the suburbs. Okay, but we seem to be moving in a different direction. Um, I think it's really exciting. All a lot of what we see here, Shoreline East, 1990, which was supposed to be a um, a temporary project, but we know what happened there that uh, activists came out and fought for it to be um, made permanent. Um, the fast track, 2015. The Hartford line, 2018. And what has made the difference to me is the 913 to stores, which has absolutely revolutionized my life and given me connections to these places. So um, we are investing in transit again. Um, and in order for us to move forward, to, to really get the benefit, this is why we are hearing this call for transit-oriented development. The fact that we are now again invested in transit. This is the 913 in stores. Um, what we need for things like the 913 to work is like what we have in stores, is transit is development that supports transit. And really that is the what this project is about is try to understand how we can get back to development that supports traffic because there are lots of benefits to doing this. So transit oriented development. So John, how am I doing on time? So why don't you take about another five minutes and then you know we'll make up the time where, wherever we need to. Okay, so transit oriented development. I like this um, quote from the Center for Neighborhood Technology, who does the organization that does a lot of work in terms of transit oriented development. They say that transit oriented development can equip communities to become more economically and environmentally resilient. And I think that's a really key issue is that transit oriented development is not just about the environment. It's as much about the environment as it is about the economy that we develop, but also it is also about social resilience. I think that's a really key point in, in going forward. Living near transit allows households to spend less on transportation and more at local businesses. And I think this is really telling, this graph showing how change our spending has changed in the US over the last several years. Um, the biggest item of spending these days is for housing. This is an, um, in contrast to 1901 when the biggest item of spending was on food. Um, second is a category called um, others. I'm not sure what that includes, but third, and something that we don't enough discuss in Connecticut, third is transit, is transportation. A large portion of our budget, um, 15, 16, and in some cases up to 40% of budget in some states go towards transportation. We often talk about Connecticut as being an expensive place, but usually what we're talking about there is tax and housing and some other things, not often transportation. This is a graph we just put together of some data we have shown the 50 states and showing the relationship between transportation spending, total transportation spending and transit spending. And you can see the more you spend on transit is the less, is, um, the less spent in total transportation spending. And interestingly, Connecticut is not doing too bad. So as we start to talk about transportation, um, TODs in Connecticut, we need to understand that in reality, we are one of the least car dependent state in the country and that we have a lot to build on. Um, in TODs, vehicle miles go down, green gases go down, low income neighborhoods are better connected to transportation are, um, are, um, opportunities and tax bases expand. So all of those are part of why we need to go forward. So the question is why, why we have not been more active in developing transit oriented development. And I would say first, we need to recognize that we are 
struggling under the weight of history. We have developed a, a way of doing things for 80 years. And what we are trying to do now is to change that history. And so some of the things that we are struggling with are things like attitudes towards race and the use of transit. One of the things I've noticed in going around Connecticut is just how this story, um, how predominantly the um, users of transit are people of color, but particularly black people, um, Indian immigrants, etc. And the question is, how do we start to change these ideas? Because I think the question of having a system that serves predominantly one part of the population makes it very, it is not a resilient way going forward. The, um, the discussion we have been having this summer about racism, I think is really important because it opens up a avenue for us to really start addressing these issues. And I, 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 I will just say that one of the things we need to understand is that racism is not just a burden. The way it's used in transportation is not just putting a burden on black and brown folks in particular, but it's also used as a way to sell suburbia to sell car-oriented development. And that's one of the things that we need to be cognizant of if we are going to change. So I'm glad to see that the, that the Segregate Connecticut has started this conversation here, and we need to continue that conversation. So other things that we have been looking at in our study is the transit. How good it is? Where does it serve? These are some maps that my undergrad students have been putting together to try to understand the connectivity, get into transit, what is the, the street network around the transit station like? What are the streets themselves like? Are they crossable or are they built mostly for cars? What are the entrance to the train stations like? We also need to think about how the financial system is not geared towards supporting um, um, TODs. We have to think about the zoning and urban planning where places are, these are some maps we have been putting together about jobs. Um, we have to think about, in particularly, about how do we restore, how do we take advantage of this talk of great buildings in places like Bridgeport? How do we build a system that we that the, the um, center of our urban areas are not follow as seen here in what should be the 100% corner in, um, in, in Bridgeport. So let me stop there because I think we need to get on with the discussion. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you, John. Thanks so much, Norman. Um, really fantastic presentation. Um, and I think it's a great way to kick off the round table. So why don't you stay, um, stay on the stage here. And then I'm gonna ask our um, other three participants to turn camera and mic on. Join us on the stage. We have uh, Melissa Kaplan Macy, uh, Denise Savageau and David Corris. Um, why don't quickly, if you each wouldn't mind, just take a minute to introduce yourself, your, um, your organization and your role. Um, and then we'll we'll get started. So why don't we start with you, Melissa? Sure. Thank you so much, John. Um, my name is Melissa Kaplan Macy. I'm Vice President for State Programs and also Connecticut Director at Regional Plan Association. We are a tri-state regional planning advocacy organization. We've been around for almost 100 years doing long-range plans for the tri-state region. And I'd say in the last four years or so, we spent a lot of time in Connecticut working on affordable housing and the interconnection to all the issues that Norman raised in his presentation um, as a foundation of sustainability for the future of the state. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, Denise? Uh, good morning. Thanks for being here and great talk, Norman. It was fantastic. Um, I'm here and I am the reti recently retired conservation director for the town of Greenwich where I served for 20 years. So very familiar with the area but also uh, now that I'm retired and even previous to that, I serve on multiple statewide boards 
and currently involved with the Connecticut Council on Soil and Water Conservation. So I do a lot of work in soil and water conservation, agriculture, and uh, this long-term planning. And I also serve on the state water planning council advisory group. So I do a lot of work on drought planning and water resource management. Excellent, thanks, Denise. David. Great, thanks uh, for having me and, and nice to be in such August company. Uh, David Corris, I'm the president of Stanford Downtown, which is uh, the largest business improvement district in the state. We represent about 100, or excuse me, about 525 property owners all clustered around uh, the Stanford uh, train station and in the historic core. Um, folks will likely recall I'm the chair of the state uh, Connecticut uh, Port Authority and former deputy commissioner at DECD, former director of resilience at the Department of Housing, former planning and development director for the city of Bridgeport and former vice president and Connecticut director of RPA. Thanks, David. Um, all right, so we'll we'll get started um, with uh, you know just some questions, and I guess I just wanted to kick things off with you know just sort of going back to the um, the resilient Connecticut planning framework and sort of the, expanding the idea of you know what we mean by resilience and including uh, things like social resilience, economic resilience, um, uh, in sort of expanding our idea of resilience beyond just sort of rebuilding um, homes and infrastructure after there's a storm, but thinking about, you know, what makes a community strong? Um, what makes a community able to withstand, um, you know, impacts and, and shocks? And so with that, um, you know, I thought it would be great to have this group of folks to just kind of talk about um, some of these issues and, and see where there's interconnections or start to tease out where there's interconnections. Um, and then we'll, we'll have a presentation at the end. Um, so maybe let's start out with you, Melissa, and um, just a question about this idea of the availability of diverse affordable housing options. You know, how, how do you see that as contributing to the overall strength and resiliency of a community? Sure, John, um, thank you. Well, I think, you know, I mean, you said it, Norman said it about you know, our social and economic sustainability and our resiliency, I think, you know, the moment we're in right now has really highlighted it in ways, you know, that I, we've never seen before with, um, you know, the pandemic and this whole notion of we're all in this together, right? And, and all the folks who have been out there on the front lines, um, you know, people working in the hospitals, keeping the grocery stores running and where people live, right? Are people, is there room for everyone in all communities? And we know in our state and Connecticut, it is a very segregated state where um, there just isn't affordability in a lot of our suburban communities. And so when we think about social cohesion and you know, the future sustainability of our towns and our cities, the need to have housing and affordability for everyone um, in all of those places. So I think you know, now is really a moment where people are starting to understand in a new way um, how homes and where we live and now we're all in our homes, right? I mean, all of us here on, well, not all of us, it looks like you're in the office, but I know, you know I've been home at my desk here for many, many months. And I think this recognition of the need for, you know, everyone to have that strong foundation is not just for some. So I really think that this is a moment where we're tying those conversations together. Um, people are starting to hear it in a new way, or at least I'm hopeful that they are. And I guess a follow-up question, you know, in terms of your work with RPA, um, you know, are there some specific policy initiatives or barriers or obstacles that you guys are focused on um, you know, in the region to promote more affordable communities? Sure, uh, there's, you know, I think, um, again, Norman, thank you for your opening presentation because you really touched on all of those things. There, there are land use regulations, right, that we have in place now, this, you know, single family zoning that is, you know, the majority of the zoning in our suburban communities, which, you know, is exclusionary in a lot of ways. I um, mean, sort of large lot single family homes has, you know, we have this very divided um, Connecticut. And so when we're looking at policies and we're looking at you know, ways that we can create more complete and sustainable communities, we really have to look at our land use regulations. And obviously land use is controlled at the local level, but there are opportunities for the state to provide policy guidance and, and new regulations as well. So you know, there's obviously a lot of conversation and we'll see this in the upcoming legislative session about the role of the state and the role of local municipalities working together, you know, hopefully towards a common goal of more sustainable inclusive communities. And I will say, I um, mean, you know, we're working very closely with the State's Department of Housing and, um, and Commissioner Mascara Bruno, and we are excited about, you know, helping 
towns be more proactive and giving them the tools that they need to do better planning to, you know, to really look at their, their zoning and their land use regulations and make the changes that, that need to be made because they do need to be happening at the local level. So when the state, I think, can provide technical assistance, you know, in the form of tools and also there is a grant out now, um, you know, a lot of communities have received technical assistance grants to create local affordable housing plans um, consistent with, you know, fairly new state legislation requiring towns now to look at this and to create plans for affordability. I think you know, those relationship between, you know, I think what people, what I hear is what people feel most comfortable with in the state is when the state government can provide local government with the tools and the support and hopefully the local governments then take that and run with it and do what needs to be done to amend our local land use laws. Um, you know, I like what I hear um, folks at desegregate CT say a lot and I completely agree is we need to understand that we created our land use regulations and we can change them. They're not sacrosanct, they're not set in stone. So now is the time really to do that. Um, and I, I think we're moving in the right direction, or I'm hopeful that we are anyway. Um, okay, so let shifting to you, David. Um, you know, this idea of, you know, you were pretty heavily involved in Resilient Bridgeport as it was kind of like envisioning and taking shape. Um, your role in Stanford now, I'm wondering if you could talk about this kind of connection between, um, you know, solving like a climate uh, driven risk like flooding in, in the south end of um, Bridgeport or, you know, some of the infrastructure that Stanford invested in a long time ago, which um, can connects with the revitalization of, of certain neighborhoods and can be tied to like development of economic opportunities. Sure. Yeah, happy to do so. I mean, I think, you know, what's what's so crucial uh, that we now realize is that, you know, infrastructure has to serve multiple objectives simultaneously, right? We can no longer have the luxury of, um, you know, just creating something that is exclusively for transportation or exclusively for water uh, pollution control or exclusively for, um, you know, climate mitigation. We have to think holistically. And, and I think as Norman described, right, really at the core of transit-oriented development is that nexus between land use and transportation, between infrastructure and, and economic development. And, and we also need to think about resilience, you know, in the terms of, of local government's capacity and, and ability to perform. And, and Norman's points about tax revenue are, are certainly not, not lost on me that, you know, fundamental uh, to decisions about resilience is making sure that there's revenue generation potential for a municipality so that they can be nimble and responsive as, you know, future, uh, you know, uncertainty exists and, and they'll have to react in, in ways that we may not be able to predict today. And so a lot of what we did in, in Bridgeport at the origins of, of the Resilient Bridgeport project was thinking about, you know, what those sort of points of acupuncture were and what those strategic investments were that could unlock social opportunity, economic growth that could create land use options that, you know, were, were buffered against future uncertainty while simultaneously addressing near term um, climate risk in, in the form of, you know, sea level rise and storm surge. And I think Stanford's actually a great case study to look to, you know, from Bridgeport, from New Haven, and from other, you know, smaller coastal communities as well, because you know, when, when they built the, the, what we call the hurricane barrier in the, in the 1960s in response to the 50s hurricanes, which was really around preserving industrial powerhouse of the city at that time, no one could have predicted that that infrastructure 40, 50, 60 years later would be the necessary foundation to allow the mixed use mixed income redevelopment that's taken place and would literally form the foundation for the walking paths and the public realm infrastructure that create the quality of life that allow us to be a creative class, you know, powerhouse in the 21st century. And so, you know, sometimes you can't predict the way in which the, res the infrastructure is going to be resilient, but thinking about it as a foundational tool to allow a municipality to evolve in ways that are often today unpredictable, you know, has to be at the core and, and making sure that every investment we make checks multiple boxes simultaneously because we, we can't afford um, to make investments that are single purpose. Right, I think, yeah, that's a great point. And also just sort of the point that we have to do two things at once, you know, which was mentioned in uh, Senator Murphy's video, sort of we have to change the way that we power our cities, the way we trans, you know, transport ourselves to work, 
Um, and at the same time, we need to prepare and uh, you know our communities for what we know is coming. So you know, thinking about how to make those investments also less carbon intensive, and you know, while at the same time uh, responding to climate change. Um, Denise, let me shift gears to you, and maybe um, you know, I'll open this by saying that sometimes there is this tension between um, development in coastal towns and um, you know the the desire to not intensify development in places that um, are at risk. Um, and in some cases, there are trade-offs and, and decisions that need to be made. But I'm wondering if you could talk about sort of the role of UC of retreat, um, you know, which I've also heard referred to as, um, you know, moving up is a better way to, that people talk about, you know, instead of retreat, nobody wants to talk about retreat, but moving up is like kind of this positive version of it. Um, so anyways, just, Sort of from your perspective, you know, how do we sort of balance that the 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 goal of taking advantage of some of this historic infrastructure um, while at the same time not making the problem worse in some places? Yeah. So I, when you talk about retreat, um, I think we it, we definitely need to think about it in the long term, responding to sea level rise. Um, the flooding that we're seeing is happening. Uh, faster, I think, than most people realize. And as the conservation director for the town of Greenwich for 20 years, I, you know, you could visually see it happening and a lot of people were not recognizing that. When I first started in 1997 in Greenwich, one of the things I was looking at was, okay, when you think about infrastructure and, you know, we a lot of times plan for 30 years uh, life of a, of a piece of infrastructure, whatever, we were looking at like, okay, what do we elevate first? And then how do we retreat? You know, thinking we had the time to do that. And now we are here 20 years later and we haven't really done all of the elevations we need and we need to retreat. So I'm actually have started thinking that we just need to focus a little bit more on retreat than just the elevation. There are places that we should be doing elevation but we need to be really looking at retreat because it's happening faster than we think. And one of the things, particularly from a housing perspective, is think about the housing stock in Connecticut. Housing stock, we don't build houses for 30 years. We might build a dam structure for 30 years, or we may get, build other things that we think are like 30 year infrastructure. But when we're talking about housing, housing is in place for the long term. So we need to cite it correctly. And that's where, like I said, originally I was thinking, you know, up and out. And now I'm just thinking we really need to focus a lot more on out. And one of the things that I think is that we really need to pay attention to is what happens during a storm event and the overnight gentrification of neighborhoods, which we saw after Hurricane Sandy, uh, Superstorm Sandy, particularly, you know, we saw it in our neighboring states, in New York and New Jersey, but we also saw it saw it in smaller neighborhoods within Connecticut where there was a lot of damage done, a lot of substantial damage done. And what we found was particularly in our low and moderate income families and a lot of moderate income families, middle income families really got caught in this. They didn't have the money to elevate um, and they did, you know, and although they got money possibly from their insurance to uh, do some restoration, they needed to do both. They got caught in this um, limbo of having to, uh, you know, they had substantial damage, so they couldn't repair their house until they elevated. Let's just say they got caught in, in a catch-22, and what we saw is a lot of people having to sell those houses, and the only people who could afford to then buy the houses were the people who could afford to elevate on their own, you know, and, and you know, meet the criteria for planning and zoning. So how do we how do we get around that? How do we make sure that we're not doing social injustice issues by by you know allowing by by not focusing on retreat? And so I think one of the things we can look at is some of the programs, for example, where we actually buy people out and you know have them relocated, but that we don't then let their property be redeveloped. We don't let it be gentrified. We actually reclaim it as um, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, depending on the, on the property, whether it be 
uh, back into tidal marsh where we've got <laughs> houses built on filled tidal marsh all over, including places like Old Greenwich. Um, we have houses, um, you know, that are, you know, in other types of floodplains. So the idea being that we should, you know, reclaim those as natural areas and green up those cities that Norman was showing how ungreen they are, and particularly in our coast area, coastal area, and putting back into the into uh, play those ecosystem services that we derive from some from tidal marshes and from sand dunes or whatever it would would be. So I think we really need to pay attention to this and how we get that done. And there are some great examples of this being done in Connecticut already. John, could I, could I jump in here? Go for it. Yeah, so, I mean, I think those are all, those are all great points, Denise. Um, but the corollary of that and what has to happen simultaneously is, is some pretty dramatic policy shifts, right? Because managed retreat or moving up and you know the undeveloping and greening of properties has significant property tax implications for, for the host community and, and can constrain their ability to make investments or you know steps uh, further in, in the direction that we need them to head. And you know what, what I'm hearing from a lot of places is is really sort of a phased approach that looks at multiple time horizons that says, Listen, this may be a neighborhood that we don't think we can allow to persevere for the next hundred years, but a targeted investment in a culvert expansion or a modest roadway, in, you know, elevation could buy us 30 years. And that 30 years of tax revenue that we're going to get from that neighborhood allows us to make an investment someplace else in the community where we can double down for the next hundred and sort of thinking about the community as a whole as a set of sort of pieces on on a game board some of which you know need to be retired immediately some of which need to be enhanced for the long term some of which play a role but it's for a limited time horizon um, you know over over the medium range and then similarly you know there's probably no better impetus for a broader conversation around the way in which we fund local government than than sea level rise and, and storm impact. I mean, I've, I've certainly been, you know, with with the cities for many years now talking about property tax reform and the inequities. And maybe for the first time, we have a coalition of municipalities that are a lot more diverse than, you know, the handful of urban centers that have been, um, you know, ringing this bell for for a generation that recognize that, that they're vulnerable too, because they're overly dependent on large single family homes on the coast that may not have the, the long-term value that, that they will depend on to meet the services for their community. And so I think you know, the two fundamental points there being thinking about multiple horizons, it's not just retreat today or double down or triple down in perpetuity. There's a lot of room there in between. And, and you know, what does this say about, for the first time in maybe a long time, Guilford and Bridgeport have something in common in both recognizing that, you know, an over-dependence on property taxes is, 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 is going to hamper us um, over the coming decades. I think, I think good points. And when I'm saying focus on retreat, it's because when we put in the multiple steps, we only focus on the first steps and we're not focusing on the retreat. We need to get retreat into the mix sooner rather than later. And I have to argue with the tax piece. And we hear this not only in terms of on the shoreline, we hear it when we're buying pieces of open space. And what happens is right now, they're correct. Those properties that are right along the shore are the, you know, a lot of times expensive properties because of the view or what, you know, why people want to leave. But when you protect them the way I've said, not just allow, uh, when you take a retreat and you take them down and now it's tidal marsh or it's beachfront or whatever, that's public open space, that next row of houses becomes your expensive real estate. So your, your tax base just retreats with it. So I understand people are concerned about that and there certainly will be an adjustment as we move through that, but to suggest, and the same thing happens when you purchase a piece of open space. People say like, oh, we have open space. We're gonna take the open space, that piece of property when we go from private ownership to, to open space, we're gonna take it off the tax rolls. But what they have found is when you put it in a piece of open space, 
all of the properties around that open space. And there's many studies done by Trust for Public Land and a whole host of organizations that all the property values around the park end up increasing in value and more than make up for the open space. And similarly, they don't need the services. So when you're talking about retreating, and like I said, I'm not talking, you know, I'm not saying relocate different, you know, for example, low income communities or middle income communities, I'm saying, let's give them an avenue for getting out of harm's way because they're the least able to be resilient and reclaim that land, not let it be gentrified by people who can afford to self insure and claim that shoreline, but will still be demanding services. And one of my roles as a planner um, in Greenwich was not just in the planning, but I also served in the emergency operations center. I was the one looking at what happens and in that room making calls on, you know, where we do evacuation, can we evacuate? And so one of the challenges I see when we put particularly people of low income, middle income uh, in housing that, okay, we just elevated, elevating houses during a, during a flood, you still have to evacuate people. You have to shut off power. You have to shut off the gas. Everything gets shut off and we need people to evacuate. So if we don't plan for this retreat and, we, and we're then planning that people are gonna have elevated houses, we need to do a heck of a lot of planning about evacuation and a whole host of other issues, long-term power outages and a host of other types of issues including things like, you know, we're gonna be dealing with more vector diseases. Um, so the healthier uh, floodplains we have, the healthier we're gonna be for vector diseases. So there's a whole host of planning issues we need to take into consideration here. So like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm moving from, I was an up and out person and I still think that there is a, a managed retreat. It's not gonna happen all at once. Just in Greenwich alone, we have over 840 homes, I believe was the number of homes in the coastal floodplain area. So when you think about that, uh, that's not gonna happen overnight, but if we don't start planning for it now, it's not gonna happen and it's gonna catch up with us. Okay, we're, we'll have to leave it there. Unfortunately, we're running a little bit behind. Um, so I wanna give Dave Murphy a chance to do his uh, presentation. And then if we have some time at the end, we can you know, reconvene for um, you know, some, some more questions from the audience. So why don't we all leave the stage and uh, take it away, Dave. Okay, pretty, thank you. Okay, and so uh, thank you everyone for teeing up this topic and my slides are meant to be a little bit compressible. So I think I can make up some time by perhaps not dwelling on a couple of them. Um, with that, I think what I'll do is just revisit a couple terms that we heard about earlier this morning. So zones of shared risk, these are zones that share common challenges. Um, they can include houses, land, infrastructure, the water, ecology, social, institutional elements, critical facilities, et cetera. And then resilient corridors is another term that we've heard about a couple of times today already. And so these are uh, corridors that we see opportunities to adapt them to uh, be more resilient over time. And they could connect uh, areas that are at risk and areas that are not as at risk as, as much. Um, and also at a larger scale, connect all of the communities along the shoreline moving inland. So I used a slide earlier today. These are kind of the three high level um, components of the planning phase that we're in phase two. So it's the data phase, the challenges phase, the opportunities phase. And then I said earlier today that we could sort of sum that up with compiling the data to set the stage, identifying the climate challenges, identifying the opportunities. And another slide, uh, that we looked at earlier, I may skip over, we'll see, but um, compiling the data to set the stage, I think it's important to just touch on some of the data that we'll be using. And if you were in this, the track two and you popped back over to this one, then you had a sneak peek at some of this data. Uh, so Circa has provided a lot of tools and data that we can use. The COGS have been providing data. The towns, to some extent, have some information that we can use. Our utilities, water, sewer, uh, power, et cetera. The CDC has a lot of tools available to us, especially in the context of social vulnerabilities. 
census data, and then for all of you in this uh, in this summit, your data. If you've got something to share with us that we can use, it'd be great to see that. And then data that we have sort of on our own from working with the towns, uh, which we're privileged to have and to use on this project. Uh, this is one of the repeat slides. So we are inheriting uh, the, the climate, sort of the coastal index that Circa has developed. And again, if you were in track two and have popped back over to this track because um, you're going back and forth, you've heard a lot about this. This is a view of the index that exists right now in the coastal towns. And our job is to kind of take this, recast it uh, with COG and town input as a climate index with flood, wind, and heat related uh, vulnerabilities as the emphasis. For now, we've parked droughts and wildfires. It may be something that we can go back and look at a little bit if we think we have time or the need to do that. So now I wanna just go a little bit more slowly and, and talk more about that task that includes the vulnerability assessment and the zones of shared risk. And what I've got on the right-hand side are kind of pictures to help explain what the words mean. So our job is to take indicators. An example here is a flood map from Stratford that Circa has enhanced to show uh, areas at risk of sea level rise. So that's the indicator box. The vulnerability box is kind of looking at what's vulnerable in a community. And this is just a view of a, of a housing project in West Haven. Then on the lower left is the vulnerability index box, which is, is what we're using right now and then augmenting uh, with other climate indicators such as heat and wind and moving inland away from the shoreline towns. And then the lower right hand side is just kind of an image of what a zone of shared risk could look like as a real as a real place. So this, is, this is a glimpse of Fairfield uh, flooding during Hurricane Sandy coastal Fairfield. So if you think about these four boxes and how they work together, our job is kind of to piece it all together um, and really characterize and explain very well these challenges. So this slide is about flooding, but what if we look at some of the other hazards? So the next box is about wind. So it's kind of the same thing. We're collecting some indicators and that's a little bit harder to do with wind. The building code talks about wind speed, but it's pretty uniform and we know that gusts can be unpredictable, but there are ways to kind of get at indicators of wind risk. We're looking at the vulnerabilities. This is a picture that I stole from the Stanford Advocate. It's a real sign that was up uh, earlier this year during the tropical storm in, in August. We'll go back to our index that we're augmenting uh, with heat and wind and other risks and then look at what the zones of shared risk could be in the context of wind hazards and how does that relate to the flood hazards and do they overlap? And then heat is another one. There's been a lot of discussion in the context of the GC3 this year about urban heat highlands and heat island effects and um, increasing risks of heat and what that causes and, and what it does to all of us. So there's indicators that are a little bit easier to get our arms around on heat, look at some of the vulnerabilities, check in with our index and identify are those zones of shared risk the same as the flood zones of shared risk? Or can we combine them in, and come up with sort of more comprehensive zones of shared risk? What would those look like? And then our job is to move from the challenges to the opportunities. And there are many things that we'll be looking at as we consider um, opportunities and, and coming up with uh, identifying locations for pilot projects to, to adapt parts of communities and be more resilient. So some of the things that we'll be looking at to decide if a challenge could become an opportunity is TOD potential nearby. Are we in an area that is near or, or includes TOD? We've heard a lot about TOD in this session. Um, and thanks, Norman, your presentation was excellent. And I plan to spend more time thinking about some of the things that you, you mentioned. Are potential resilient corridors nearby? Can we adapt structures to withstand occasional flooding? If we can't, what can we do instead? Can we protect uh, communities through healthy buffering ecosystems? These are things that the deputy commissioner mentioned this morning in her speech. Can we identify affordable housing opportunities? Can we promote energy, economic, and social resilience? Because if we can answer all these questions, we can turn some of these challenges into opportunities. And there are many other things that we'll be looking at. I won't read all the words here, but where are critical facilities? Where's the critical infrastructure? Where's rail and bus service, sewer systems? Where do we have sewer avoidance areas such as Guilford, Madison? Um, so we have septic systems instead. Where are the drinking water systems? What areas are served by private wells? Can we make an area more resilient if it has some of these limitations or some of these benefits? So here is the, um, I'm gonna check the time, doing all right. The fun part of this presentation and where I want you to think about all the words that have been spoken already in the last few minutes by Norman, Melissa, David, and Denise, because they should be rattling around in your head as we kind of go through 
these three examples. I want to talk about areas that are good examples for what we're going to be looking for going forward, some that we believe have already been adapted, some where progress is underway, and some where we're waiting for action. So without any further ado, Merritt and Green, I mentioned it this morning, this is one that we consider to be largely adapted. The area has flooded, Harbor Brook still floods, but what is there instead of buildings and houses? It's open space. But TOD is very adjacent to this. It's right off the page, in fact, right off to the, to the left of this photograph is the, is the railroad station at Meriden. The Meriden has capitalized on the, this asset, daylighting the stream, producing an area that can flood when a flood occurs, and then adapting buildings and redeveloping in the vicinity, all in proximity to a TOD area. So pictures lower right is kind of a flood occurring um, in the Meriden Green Park. How about some places where there's been work, progress is underway, but there's more that can be done. So West Haven is a great example. West Haven has recognized that there are houses that have to be bought out. They are going to be repeatedly flooded and the situation will get worse. A view of acquisitions, never an exciting photograph, but that's what it looks like um, immediately after the building is gone in the lower left. But what else is West Haven doing? They know that they need to retreat to some extent, but there are areas where they cannot. So they're looking at have maybe developing some sort of dune ridge system along the, uh, the main beach area for some flood protection. And then there are buildings behind whatever dune is in place that will still have some residual risk and what can be done to adapt those buildings. And there's been discussions when we work with the city about maybe elevating, adding space on top of buildings that are residential so that uh, the building itself is more resilient. How about other communities? We talked about Bridgeport, um, we talked about resilient Bridgeport. What about the West End? So this is an area where there's a desire for some economic development, a lot of commercial properties. And what else though? Entirely in a flood zone. This is a map of the FEMA flood zone. So what can be done when you want to have economic development in an area that it's not as easy to retreat from? Businesses are already there, but it's going to flood. Well, you can work with those businesses to make sure they are individually resilient, that the utilities that serve them are resilient, and then they can continue to be in place for a while as we decide whether or not they should move over the long run. Uh, and now we're moving on to some areas, examples perhaps that are waiting for some action. Uh, long Wharf is one such area. Um, the city has done a lot of good work planning for Long Wharf. Um, so much good work, in fact, that the project or the situation was advanced to the Army Corps of Engineers to complete a study and flood protection is maybe one of the solutions that can be used to protect this area. Uh, don't forget our inland towns, Waterbury Freight Street, also very near TOD, near the railroad station. This is an area that was that is ripe for redevelopment and a greening of sorts and can be made more resilient. Uh, let's go to some rural areas, Branchville, which is part of Ridgefield. This is an area where a TOD study has been completed, been completed by the COG and by others. Um, train station is immediately adjacent to a flood zone. So there may be opportunities to, to really actually not just give up on this area, but to make it more resilient and develop it further. So if we take all these individual opportunities that we know about, I'm gonna play through the animation very quickly so I can wrap up all these blue stars. And then the ones that are on the horizon that I didn't even mention, Danbury, Greenwich has a resiliency plan going on, Fairfield's done a lot of work, Naugatuck, Milford's done, Milford's done a lot of work, especially in the Wildemar Beach area. Branford, there was a question submitted, which we'll get to about Branford. To patch these all together and add the ones that I haven't mentioned, David Corris, you'll notice I didn't mention Stanford because I wasn't sure if you would have some examples. Um, so there's a question mark over Stanford, but it doesn't mean nothing's going on. And then you kind of piece things together. You can see how we can build some resilience corridors. Next step, we've got a couple of workshops coming up. Um, one of them, the first series will be in January, February, working directly with the COGS to kind of further the vulnerability assessment and look at some of the zones of shared risk. And the second workshop will be in the spring to take some of those zones of shared risk and try to identify opportunities for pilot projects. And again, with the examples that I just went through, we can't take credit for any of those, but that's a really good template for what we'll be looking at going forward. And um, I will stop sharing at this point. Back to John. Thanks, David. Um, all right, so it looks like we've got about 10 minutes left. 
Um, so I think we have a little bit of time for questions if we want to have the, the panelists come back um, and we'll try to go through and see if we have any um, you know, questions from the audience. It looks like we have a question about Brantford in particular. In Brantford, there's a TOD zone near the train. Several large developments have been proposed along the Brantford River. Um, there is a two lane road access in a flood zone. So again, this is this idea of how do we balance development with um, you know, environmental um, impacts, including density. Um, and I will just put that to the group if anybody wants to take it. I'd take a shot at the generic and then, and then someone who's more familiar with, with Brantford in particular, Dave or someone else can, can delve into it. I mean, I think, I think it's a perfect example of why a regional approach is so necessary and why this study is so important. Because listen, you know, we're not gonna move the rail line at least not anytime soon. I mean, we've seen how difficult it's been to even make targeted improvements in the rail line and communities get up in arm, like locating a new transportation corridor is, is practically unprecedented in the Northeast, right? So I think we have to acknowledge what things are static and what things are, are up for, for modification. And so with that said, you know, you have at one end of the spectrum, immovable infrastructure, that is set in stone. You have at the other end of the spectrum, the, the very real need for, for retreat and, and the examples that Denise gave around value added, created by new open space, et cetera, et cetera. And the key is figuring out where every place sits on that spectrum and, and where they are in between. And you can only do that when you take a step back and say, is the development potential around Brantford TOD such that it offsets the necessary improvements, whether it's an elevation of a road, whether it's you know you know reconfiguration of a section of a river corridor, whether it's elevation uh, or widening you know of, of a piece of infrastructure, et cetera, and then you can take a look and say, okay, here's our list of needs, here's our list of costs, where's the line that we have to draw, how do we prioritize, and let's get started. We know there's things at the top, like the rail yard in New Haven. It's not going anywhere. It has huge needs. It's really costly. And the rest of the region depends on it. So we just tick down the list from there. I don't know where Brantford TOD sits, right? I don't know if it sits high up on the list, down low, or kind of right at the threshold, but it's only by taking the regional perspective that you can understand the relative value and the relative cost of, of unlocking the potential of each individual place. If I could just jump in, I, I agree with what David said. And the one thing when you're looking at cost and one of the challenges we're seeing, and this is coming out in the Governor's Council on Climate Change, some of the reports, and I was work on the Working and Natural Lands Committee, is that we're underestimating the ecosystem services provided, whether it be for flood storage, whether it be carbon sequestration of, in forests and in soils, we need to be looking at this because as we're trying to adapt to climate change, we need to make sure that we're taking all of these considerations in play. And I, I think the bigger picture for me is there's this nexus between water and that's water supplies, water, you know, in terms of water resources in general with flooding and, and whatever they do for us, but public drinking water supplies, food supply, and we talked about the insecurity. And I think the whole idea of climate change and issues that we're going to be dealing with. When you think of the food supply during the pandemic, the need for local food supplies and the insecurity we have. So when we're trying to bring in that social justice issues, where does transit development in a particular area fit into that? And then the, 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 this nexus is, is food, water, and energy. And when I'm saying energy, it's not just the energy infrastructure. It is the transportation infrastructure. It's the building infrastructure. It's everything that is energy and, and the human built. And, and we need to balance that because we need all of that. We need this built environment. And like I said, I'm putting energy in there, but we also need this, this we need water and we need to respect what water does for us. And then we need to, you know, from a drinking supply, as well as you know, the other, other roles that water plays in, in our lives here. And then, and we also have to look at this food security issue. And as a state, we're making really, really bad decisions on 
local food and whatever, and we need to think about that. Urban agriculture is a big issue, so how does that that play in? So I, you know, I think whenever, and I, I'm not as familiar with the Branford, so again, I'll let someone else talk about that, like David did. But I think we need to look at all of those. How do how do we balance all of this as we're looking? If we're going to say transit oriented and to development is where we need to go. How does it fit with, between this triangle? And, and just to let you know, I didn't make up that triangle. The United Nations made up this triangle that we really need to be balancing on. And so if we're gonna be talking about resilience, we need to balance that triangle. So um, John, may I just add? Please. Uh, I, I think the only other thing I would add to this point is that we also need to think about the built, the existing built environment. And um, I think that is often overlooked in Connecticut is how does um, the planning fit in with the existing built environment? Because it's not just about building new, it's, it's building on what we already have and make taking advantage of what we have. And so the question is, in Brantford, how does it fit into the rest of the urban fabric that we have surrounding it? So that's, that, that's an additional piece of what needs to be added to the puzzle. Okay, thanks for that. Um, let's see, I think we have time for maybe one quick question. Um, so there's a question about sort of, you know, towns have to update their plan of conservation and development every 10 years. Um, as your maps show, some towns are still not doing anything about resilience in a meaningful way or, or with urgency. How can we urge our towns to act? Use a carrot and stick approach? Question mark. The, the whole, I, I believe wholeheartedly that the, the planning mandate for municipalities needs to be totally overhauled, whether it's complete streets, sustainability, climate mitigation, resilience, affordable housing. You know, there's all these exogenous topics that can have these supplemental plans that exist alongside our plans of conservation and development, but are not incorporated. And, and it allows you to sort of push them off to the side because they're not the guiding document in the community with teeth. And so I, I do think as a state, we should take a step back and, and reassess the requirements of what communities have to take into consideration um, in that document, whether it's food security, affordable housing, or, or you know, broader you know, resilience. And, and in doing so, it'll, it'll force those conversations in the participatory process that I think we all know as professionals and having been involved in communities around Connecticut will inevitably result in people starting to make better decisions because they'll be better informed about how things interact with one another and, and how they shape the future. And I want to applaud the state for having the COGS do plan of conservation developments. All the COGS are now doing, are in the process of doing plans of conservation development and they are all incorporating this. And when we talk about this regional approach, I think it's critical and I applaud you know, the, the work that's being done and hopefully will inform because a lot of what we're talking about, we're talking about transit and when we're talking about uh, utilities, whether it be energy utilities, water supplies, there's a whole lot of issues that are being, that need to be handled in terms of climate change. And although, uh, you know, we always go to the sea level rise because it's very dramatic and whatever, there's so much other work that needs to be done. And we're probably not communicating out the urgency on, for example, the heat that work that needs to be done, or even the riverine flooding that we could see. Um, you know, we dodged the bullet when Irene hit Vermont and, and Massachusetts, and they're doing that kind of planning. And Connecticut hasn't really done that kind of planning um, for our riverine systems that we need to do. So, uh, you know, hopefully the towns are embracing it. But I, but I, like I said, I'm very encouraged, and I think it's an important piece that the Cogs are doing this. Thanks for that. Um, sure, very quickly. Oh, as I said, I just wanted to, you know, amplify what, what David was saying, you know, in terms of the broader landscape and, you know, the state and looking at the regulatory kind of environment around lands of conservation and development. But I think in the meantime, you know, providing, um, you know, some resources and tools, I, I just think it's interesting how Sustainable Connecticut has really taken off, how people have really taken that up and are interested in participating in that. I've seen a huge interest, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, from folks on this guidebook on how to do an 830J affordable housing plan. So I think, you know, as we're working on sort of the bigger picture systems, just providing tools and resources that towns can use to do good planning because they are asking really good questions and they do, I think, you know, 
in large part want to, you know, want help to figure out how to plan better, how to implement better. So I think we kind of need to work on both ends while we're trying to kind of, you know, reimagine how the structural pieces could be done better. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's a huge focus for our project and developing all these tools. But then, of course, uh, working with towns, doing the training, actually, you know, sitting down and how do you actually use this information? What does it look like? So that's going to be a big uh, focus for what we're doing um, through the, the rest of the project. So it's 11.45. Um, we have to unfortunately wrap up. I wish we had a couple of hours to, to talk with everybody because I know that we left a lot on the table here in terms of the topic. Um, so with that, why don't we get the panelists, you can go ahead and exit the stage. Um, and then I am gonna share my screen once again um, and just give you the closing slide, not my email. Um, okay, so you know, next steps again, as I mentioned, we're gonna be doing developing technical tools and training, identifying projects, um, look out for these workshops that Maloney McBroom and DuBerry are going to be leading um, in the winter and the spring. These are going to be critical for kind of where we go with this project and what it looks like. So I really hope that everybody will participate, get involved, even if we have to do it over Zoom, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get it done. Um, a reminder that you can sign up for the, uh, the Resilience Roundup at circa.ucon.edu. And um, a, rem a reminder about um, some of the credits that Katie talked about earlier. Um, and so with that, we're going to wrap up uh, this, this summit. And uh, thanks, everybody, for attending. And we hope to see you again soon.